Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans, the movie news show where we give you a little bit of insight into what everything means in the world of movies. I am Ashley Mova. <laughs> no, no, I am not. I am uh, I am John Campy, of course. I'm the senior producer over here at Collider Video. And uh, the reason we have no Ashley, the reason we have no Sinead, is we needed a little bit extra space today because it is the OG crew here at the table today. <laughs> with the four of us back together again for the day. I'm going to start, instead of on my left, I'm going to start sitting right over here on my right. She is a screenwriter, filmmaker, world traveler, <laughs> uh, former senior editor at uh, Movie News. Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach Yay! is here. Yay! Hey! Are you I miss you guys. It's so nice to be back. And your dig's a little different, a little yeah. different looking. Um, but yeah, I missed you guys. And back from my adventures. Good it's to be home. very green. Very it's very green <laughs> now. <laughs> of course, sitting over there in the end is, of course, we had to have the all the OGs on the table today. Mr. Dennis Zen. Yeah, I'm so happy the OG crew is back. It's, it's been a long time. It's like we were going, taking a time machine going back six months or something yeah. like that. <laughs> That's and right. Sitting over here on my left, of course, is Mr. John Schnepp. Yeah, we're talking about the 1920s. See? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll understand what we mean by that a little bit later. Uh, all right, folks, since uh, the people who are actually really good at this are not here today, I will be <laughs> reading the stories today. So bear with me as I struggle through it. Let's get to topic number one. First item today. With the 2017 Wonder Woman movie set to go into production in the next few months, reports have emerged that acclaimed cinematographer Hoyt Van Hoytma, who served as the director of photography for such films as Interstellar, The Fighter, and the upcoming James Bond film Spectre, has joined the crew. He joins director Patty Jenkins with a June 2017 release date on the books. Dennis, do you like the addition of Hoytma as the cinematographer for Wonder Woman? I think it's a fantastic choice, especially uh, he's most known for filling in for Wally Pfister, who went to go do uh, Transcendence. Because uh, he's yeah, because he's usually, he usually does Chris Nolan's film. You know, a lot of directors usually have one or two cinematographers that they use, and Wally Pfister is like almost exclusively with Chris Nolan. But um, he filled in, and he did a great job. The reason why I like it so much is. Not only is he a great cinematographer, he did uh, Her, he did uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, he did a bunch of other films. Which is a really underrated movie, Yes, it is. Great film. And is that he he seems to be able to adapt his style to the director and to the type of movie. So he doesn't have this one style. If you watch Her or you watch even the trailer for the upcoming Spectre, which like it kind of more mimics Sam Mendes' style that he had with Roger Deakins for uh, Skyfall. Right. So I think... Someone with like Patty Jenkins, who she hasn't done, uh, she did a bunch of TV after she did right. Monster. Yeah. Uh, I think having someone that, that's that adaptable and uh, that can collaborate, I think would work well with, with her. Amy Rose? Yeah, couldn't agree more. I mean, this film is shaping up in a really good way. I know when it was first cast, we're like, okay, we'll see. Wonder Woman being on screen made me extremely excited. But I got to tell you, after seeing Gal Gadot in Batman v Superman, just a little bit, I'm I'm a believer now. I really am. I think in this universe, she's going to perform. And getting a world-class cinematographer like this to really shape the sequence and make the time period come alive is what you need. I think you nailed it because you look at Wally Pfister's resume, and he's really good at the Budgers. I love him, mm -hmm. granted. And I'm not going to give up on him because of the one dud of his directorial efforts. I still think he has talent. But, I mean, Hoyt, great name, by the way. He looks like he's from Game of Thrones in that picture as well. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I just think this is exactly what you need. Regardless of a smaller budget or a larger budget, he really knows how to make the atmosphere come alive, and that's what you want for a film like this. So I'm really excited about it. One of the things that we've, we've seen in, in uh, Hoyt of the House Hoytma is that <laughs> you know, he can do the intimate. It a, a lot of people think when they think of a good cinematographer, they think of how well they do the big grand sweeping mm. shots. Find me a cinematographer who is really good at bringing the close, intimate scenes to life. And you got a winner. You mentioned Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, mm -hmm. Her, things like that. So we see that in, in those types of things. You see him work with a visual effects heavy kind of situation in Interstellar and make it, you know, contribute to making it feeling sweeping and epic and all that kind of stuff. You're right. He's flexible. He's adaptable. He can do a lot of different things. And as Amy Rose pointed out, a lot of us forget that this is going to be somewhat a period piece, at least in some some parts of the movie, the ability to bring different, you know, uh, sensibilities to those different eras and different scenes is something he's going to be really good at. 
I'm going to reserve how totally excited I'll be about it until I see Spectre because that's that's a different kind of film than we see on his resume. But the trailers visually, like even those shots when Bond's in the balcony and how they shoot that shot looking down on that table below. Chris off. <laughs> yeah, very impressive stuff. So that could just send my enthusiasm right through the roof. I think this is a great move. Yeah, I think he's a great cinematographer. When you look at his body of work so far, uh, what I see that binds everything together is in camera. Uh, all of his work, her, Interstellar, even right to, uh, what's the other one, uh, Spectre, which we haven't seen yet, but from the clips that we've seen, all the directors also like to have in camera, like not a lot of special effects, not we're going to fill all that in with green screen. A lot of it's just shot right there. And I think his ability to capture that is what's so strong about his cinematography. So I'm wondering if they're going to do that in Wonder Woman, if they're going to use a lot of in-camera, um, you know, not a lot of special effects to, to capture World War One. I. I know they just started scouting locations where they're going to shoot, you know, actually in locations that were used in World War One for real. So I'm excited about the their choice of a uh, cinematographer for this. All right, let's move on. The next item up. According to a report in The Wrap, casting for Star Wars Episode Eight is moving full steam ahead and the lead female role is down to a short list. The report claims that actresses Gina Rodriguez from Jane the Virgin, Tatiana Maslany from Orphan Black, and Olivia Cook from Me and Earl and the Dying Girl are amongst the finalists for the role. The report also claims that the shortlist actresses are scheduled to have a chemistry read with John Boyega in the next few weeks. Amy Rose, what do you think of this short list of actresses for Star Wars Episode Eight? Oh, I'm so excited. Um, I think this is great. I mean, not only are they pretty unconventional actresses, none of them are A-list. They're not huge names, which I really like. They're all they all got their start on TV. I think that says a lot about just the ever evolving landscape of TV and how some of the best talent starts from there nowadays. Um, Tatiana, she finally got an, 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 an Emmy nomination, Emmy. and everyone's been like, "Come on!" And she <laughs> plays what like ten characters on that show. Right. She's phenomenal. Olivia Cook, Me Earl, and the Dying Girl is one of my favorite films of the year. She is just she had the vulnerability and just everything you want out of that character. And it was a really tough role. And Gina, I can't say I've watched Jane the Virgin, but I, I think she's talented. I've seen her in a couple other things. She's definitely been working for a while. So I think this is great. And John, he's so good. Attack the block. Like just, I'm just so <laughs> excited about this with Ryan Johnson at the helm. I just think this is really good. I don't think they could lose with any of them, but I would really like Olivia because I think she's a really, she's a rising star. She's so good. She has such conviction in every role she's been taking on and she's been carefully picking her slate. So I'm excited, but all three of these I'd be for. It's hard for me to, to say which one I think would be best for the part when I don't know what the part is. I mean, I just don't know. But the one burning question this raises for me, what the hell happened to Daisy Ridley? Lead female character in Star Wars Episode Eight, doing, you know, uh, reads, compatibility reads with John Boyega? Where's Daisy Ridley going? It like, now this raises a whole bunch of questions for me about, does Daisy Ridley die? In this movie, is she or does she just you know go off to another galaxy at some point? Is she not around come the end of the film? That's what I am now most. It's not what I should be focused on. I should be focused on these incredibly talented women behind me, but I'm not. I'm completely focused on what are you talking about, lead actress for episode eight? I thought we had our lead actress for this new franchise, and now my head is all a flutter with warning. Amy Rose is right not knowing what the character is, so we don't know which one of these would fit the best. I just know that all three of these are uber talented, getting mm -hmm. huge recognition right now. So obviously you can use them in any role you want, but I am still most fascinated by what on earth is happening with but Daisy Ridley. But she's already been cast, so maybe it's just that, you know, another lead actress to join the franchise. Yeah, maybe. Right. I hope that's the case. Yeah. I hope that's the case. Dennis, how do you see this? Yeah, I agree with you guys about how talented these actresses are. I haven't really watched Orphan Black, but I did see Tatiana Maslany in uh, Women in Gold yeah. with Helen, and I thought she stood out she did. From, from it, even though it was a smaller role. She played Helen Mirren's character when she was younger, and I thought she did a good job. What this actually sparks is, you guys were talking on Jedi council before about this this rumor and there's been a lot of rumors right is this han solo's daughter judging from these three i don't think so unless it's someone that he had a daughter with that wasn't princess Leia. because i hey. don't because i don't see <laughs> these three like yeah. daisy ridley fits the and I, I, none of these were conceived by the time <laughs> return of the jedi was right. around yeah <laughs> so it, it's it, it's interesting because if if I don't think those rumors are true. Plus, you guys always talk about not making Star Wars so small. And by making one of these actresses, um, 
Han Solo's daughter and then having some sort of romantic interest with John Boyega, it's like, okay, then you're making it small again, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, another Han Solo, Princess Leia daughter, something like that, that now she falls in love with one of the main characters that we already know. So I, I, I hope uh, that it's that they're not related to, to either one of them. Shep? I don't know if they're going to be related, but <clears throat> like the first six Star Wars, these next three are going to be still part of the Skywalker legacy. Yeah. So I don't, I, I'll, I'll see them as they're going to all be interconnected. But <clears throat> my vote goes for Tatiana because she's like you said, she's already played like 400 different <laughs> yeah. characters in Orphan Black. So it doesn't even matter who she's going to play in, in uh, episode eight. You already know she could play the she character. She could do anything. She's super talented. So I, I'm happy. I hope she they, she gets picked. So. All right, folks, you reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of me, I have several other items in the world of movie news that I'm going to run down. Once I do, all of us at the table are going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So here we go. Starting off with this. A new trailer for the upcoming Michael Fassbender, Marion Cotillard film Macbeth has hit the web. A new adaptation of William Shakespeare's period tragedy. Macbeth is the story of a fearless warrior and inspiring leader brought low by ambition and desire. A thrilling interpretation of the dramatic realities of the times and a truthful reimagining of what wartime must have really been like for one of Shakespeare's most famous and compelling characters. A story of all-consuming passion and ambition set in war-torn 11th century Scotland. Schnepp, buy or sell this trailer for Macbeth. What's done is done. <laughs> Cannot be undone or something like that. I buy it. I love Shakespeare and this just is it's so exciting to see these amazing actors. Marion Cotillard, Michael Fassbender, this crazy director, whatever this trailer, this trailer looks dope. It looks amazing. It looks it looks like everything. I love Shakespeare because it's so ultra violent and strange. I mean, Shakespeare really is like weird theater to me. Um, you you egg, you know. <laughs> last time you ever hear somebody call somebody an egg. How dare you? Yeah, how oh, dare damn you? spot. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I cannot wait to see this. Uh, and it's you know, it's oh, Shakespeare is always a couple of years. Every couple of years, somebody does a Shakespearean adaptation. And recently we've seen a lot of different Shakespearean adaptations done in different time periods, like Coriander, or, you know, there's a whole bunch of ones where they like kind of move it into the war, like, you know, the recent wars and things like that, and try to update Shakespeare. So I like that this is taking place in the time that it's supposed to take place in. So I, I buy it 100%. Amy Rose? I buy it passionately as well. Um, I'm really intrigued about this production. Not only was it nominated, this film already at Cannes for the Palme d'Or, mm -hmm. yeah. the top prize, mm -hmm. which is says speaks leagues of itself already. But I mean, they're teaming up again for Assassins, obviously. Right. Michael Fassbender, same cast. That says a lot. And this director has not been on the scene for a long time. And one thing that lives very dominantly in his work is that they're all very violent. But he doesn't use violence for shock value. He uses it to show the maddening, like the darkness of these characters and how they turn to violence. And Macbeth, what better character <laughs> in history than that? I mean, Shakespeare does it right, as you said. So I'm really passionate about this production. And it looked beautiful beautifully shot. I mean, I could not be more excited. Now, so what we got here is we got the same director, lead actor, lead actress as Assassin's Creed. I'm theorizing here that Macbeth is actually the ancestor to the guy mm -hmm. in the Assassin's Creed <laughs> yes. movie. The this is actually a prequel to, no, it, no, it's really not. I buy this trailer. I love the rawness of it. Mm -hmm. There was no, when you watch this trailer, there's nothing glamorous in this trailer. There's no jump spinning sword swings there's nothing to to look you know spectacular or, no it's raw Brutal. and it's gritty and the performances just look that same way raw and gritty and all that kind of stuff uh, fastbender i was what look i'm a big fan of michael fastbender but you want a, a litmus test for an actor throw him in something with shakespeare and let's see what happens and it's just the trailer but he owned it he inhabited it i'm watching it's like this dude is a born Shakespearean actor. It looks awesome to me. Huge buy for me. Dennis? Yeah, big buy for me. It looks like a cross between like Braveheart and Game of Thrones. Yes. From the, And the cinematography is gorgeous. And, and what you said uh, is what I was thinking. is like, I don't know much about Justin Kurtzel, the director, but obviously Michael Fassbender was very happy with how this movie turned out because right. he brought him along for Assassin's Creed. And I think he just wants that same chemistry with, with obviously Marion Cotillard and this director and him all together. So I, now that this pumps me up for Assassin's Creed. All right. 
According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, actor Josh Gad has signed on to play the role of Roger Ebert in the upcoming film Russ and Roger. The film is based on the true story of the unique relationship between Roger Ebert and provocative filmmaker Russ Meyer while they made Beyond the Valley of the Dolls at 20th Century Fox, which released to major box office success in 1970. Will Ferrell is already attached to star as Russ Meyer. Dennis, buy or sell Josh Gad joining Russ and Roger as Roger Ebert. I'll buy it because I'm fascinated with the story. You know, Roger Ebert is the most famous movie critic of all time. And just hearing that he had written this this movie that that got made, they, they kind of touched on it briefly in uh, that documentary Life itself mm-hmm. with him. And I want to see how that came to be and how it was on set and how... You know, because there's different takes. Like some people are taking like, oh, that movie's terrible. Or maybe it, it's actually kind of more of an inside type of like comedy, a satire on those type of movies. I, I don't know. I want to see this this movie. And Josh Gad, to me, I remember when he first came out, I thought he was like a poor man's Jonah Hill. Uh, <laughs> but lately I've seen him more and I've enjoyed him. And I've seen that he has a different vibe than that. He did. He just recently, they canceled that show, um, The Comedians, that he did with, with Billy Crystal. Crystal. It's like, right. he must be good enough if he's on a show with, a legend like Billy it was Crystal. Canceled. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. canceled. Uh, but but he, I, I liked. I watched. I didn't watch all of it. But I watched enough episodes to realize, hey, he's actually a decent. He's getting comedian. good at getting his shows canceled. He also had that one where he's like the president's son. Sixteen hundred. That was terrible. Though. <laughs> yeah, yeah but that was. But he wrote that too. Oh, I think. did he? Yeah, I believe okay. he was like the, the writer of it. He, he keeps making fun of uh, that show in the comedians too. Like mm. they always reference it. He really? always trying to give Billy Crystal like DVD copies of it and stuff. Like that. <laughs> yeah. That's, cute. That's great, Amy Rose. I'm sorry, Josh. I got to sell this for now. And it's mostly because of how much Siskel means to me. Um, I grew up on on Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Mm. That is why I wanted to be in this industry. I would watch it with my parents like this, so close to the TV, and just be so excited at them debating and being so passionate about film. That's honestly why I'm here. So it... I'm just really protective over his legacy. I thought life itself was, I cried. It was so touching. It was, he, I mean, for those who don't know, like the rare disease he got, like Mm -hmm. it was a very brutal ending to his life, but he was one of the most profound and prolific people in film that we've ever had. So I'm not saying that he can't do it, but Siskel was the one with the comedy and Gene was not. He did (laughs) not. I mean, excuse me, I keep combining their names. Uh, Roger was not. And so Josh is going to have to play it pretty straight. And I'm not saying he can't do it, but he would not be my first choice. So I'll be optimistic cautiously, but for now I'm going to sell it until I see more. Roger Ebert, I say this a lot on the show, Roger Ebert is my all-time favorite film critic. And I very rarely agreed with him. I actually, (laughs) at least 50% of the time, I thought he was off his rocker. But the key for me anyway, of a good film critic is not the critic who says things I agree with. It's the one who really articulate, articulately says what it is and explains why it is they think the way they Mm -hmm. think, because that helps me understand why I think the way I think. That's the mark of a great film critic. And he was a great film critic. And I loved him. I got to sell this. And and I reserve the right to withdraw my (laughs) cell later. On. <laughs> the reason I sell it, number one, I have not yet been impressed with Josh Gad. Um, was he fine as the voice of Olaf in Frozen? Sure, but that's that's going into a sound booth for a couple of days, whatever. That's that's different from bringing a full performance. Uh, and in no disrespect to true voice actors, I'm just saying it's a little bit of a different thing. I also I'm a little bit worried of a 21 Jump Street approach to this. Mm. Josh Gad, Will Ferrell, it feels like a raunchy comedy and that might not be the way that we have seen that will ferrell can do straight drama yeah. um and and so there's totally possibility for that so i'm going to give it a sell based on my fear that they're going to go to wah, wah, you know kind of thing with it because i don't want that i want to see a really cool with humor story of this you know dolls movie i want to see that if they do it i'll withdraw the sell but for now it's a sell I'm going to enthusiastically buy this for many reasons. Uh, Roger Ebert, I got a chance to meet him several times because I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago where they had many Russ Meyer retrospectives. <laughs> and Roger Ebert would come and actually talk about the films after they would show them. I'm so jealous. Not only the ones that he wrote, he was also ghost wrote a couple, and he's really good friends with Russ Meyer. Russ Meyer even came to the Art Institute. So let's just clear the air. I love Russ Meyer films. They're really funny. They're really raunchy. And they're... 
that Roger Ebert helped make one of the craziest, weirdest films beyond the Valley of the uh, the Ultra. Uh, what is it called again? The Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. The dolls. And then they, he made another one, the Ultra Vixens. There's they're just big breasted, crazy <laughs> sex comedies. Russ Meyer was unabashedly fun. He was like he's a filthy guy. He was like I see Will Ferrell knocking it out of the park. I'll I just use that phrase we use all the time because Michael Winterbottom is directing this. Now Michael Winterbottom is not. Uh, cut from the same cloth as Adam McKay. So right. this is not going to be a film that's like a raunchy comedy, like a you know a 21 Jump Street or anything like that. It's actually going to, my opinion of it, after looking at, do you see the body of work that Michael Winterbottom's done? It's going to be actually kind of a serious kind of look at these guys' friendship and the way they work together, making this crazy film under, the, under a giant studio, basically saying, we're giving you a ton of money to make a, a really weird crazy sex comedy yeah. so i think uh josh gad is also a really underrated actor because he hasn't gotten the, the thing that will actually put him over the top i think him playing roger ebert will put him over the top i saw him in book of mormon when where he first mm -hmm. came up and he was incredible in that role the guy can sing he's a really good actor i think he, he can he, sing yeah. i heard him do some stuff for some some advanced stuff at d23 mm -hmm. they did they showed us clips of him and luke evans um, since they they did couldn't show us a trailer, but they had him and Luke Evans sitting together, starting to sing uh, "Oh What a Guy That Gaston," mm. and the two of them sang it together. Gad can sing. Oh yeah, no, that's like not just you know. Oh yeah, that's an actor, and she sings. Oh, she can. Sing. No, no, no. Josh Gad can sing. No, it's I mean crazy. the Book of Mormon's a musical. Yeah. I don't think and he was one of the leads. I never saw so. it though. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm just saying, give credit yeah. where credit's due, yeah. man. That yeah. dude's got pipes. Did you see, um, "Wish I Was Here," Zach Braff's film. Josh Gad played his brother. That's right. Yeah, and he actually was really solid. I don't think he can't do it, but again, it's it's the role. yeah. No, I saw Gardens, the first one. Garden I didn't State. see the sequel, yeah. but uh, yeah. So I buy this for all those reasons, yeah. and I think this will be a really cool way for a lot of people who didn't know Roger Ebert's other side and just knew him as a film critic. He's one of the most incredible film critics ever. ever. Uh, but this is this other side of him that he truly loved and no one really knows about it. So I'm looking forward to seeing people embrace this weirdness. You know, you brought up something else that reminds me of one a reason to be enthusiastic about this. The background to how Valley of the Dolls came out is actually fascinating. The reason <clears throat> it even got made in the first place with how, you know, how did 20th Century Fox start working with a, with a guy with the reputation at the time of a Russ Meyer? 20th Century Fox had gone through a series of bombs. They were mm -hmm. financially really hurting and they thought we need to try something different. They turned to Russ Meyer. Meyer's like, okay, yeah, I'll do it, but only if I can get Roger Ebert, who was one of the only film critics to ever give his film a positive review. <laughs> it's like, like the story is actually yeah. really fascinating. Yeah. So that's something to keep your eye on as well. All right, let's move on. Next up, as many of you know, Matt Damon is currently preparing to return to the role of Jason Bourne in the upcoming Bourne 5. Now, according to a report in Variety, we know who will be hunting Jason as the film's antagonist. Veteran actor Vincent Cassell. Cassell has enjoyed most of his success in European cinema, but is also known for his roles in American films such as Black Swan, Eastern Promises, and the Ocean's Eleven series. Amy Rose, buy or sell the addition of Vincent Cassell as the villain in Bourne 5. Big fan. I think Vincent, buy, sorry. <laughs> I think Vincent is extremely talented. He usually plays a side supporting character, um, which I guess he will still be, but he can be very powerful. He, he does play the villain a lot. I really liked him in Danny Boyle's trance as well, um, but he's just got this dynamic presence on screen and he's very believable. He really loses himself in the role. And I wasn't the biggest fan of the Renner born. Um, as I've said many times, I just felt like the plot was just a lot thinner, but Damon is is amazing at this role and reteaming with Greengrass, which we've heard was going to happen for so many years. We're like, yeah, yeah, but it's happening. So I think all the pieces are forming. I'm really excited for this film. Schnapp. Yeah, I love Vincent Cassell. Uh, you guys got to check him out. He's on Netflix. I think it's still available. It's a uh, two films. It's one is the first one's called Public Enemy Number One, and the second one's called Mezrin. It's about this gangster Mezrin that he plays. He's the lead, and he's fantastic. You're right. He's usually subjugated to these second second string roles as a villain. Why? Because he's awesome at being second. evil. He's a <laughs> bastard. You like to watch him beat people up and taunt people and throw people off buildings. He's evil incarnate. Yet he can play a good guy very rarely. So I'm glad he's being cast. That's the villain in this, because you know he's going to bring it. So I buy this. For me, big buy. This dude is massively talented mm -hmm. and never really appreciated 
the way he deserves to be appreciated in the North American markets. Mm, like totally. when you watch Black Swan, he was incredible in yeah, Black Swan. Yes. As that creepy, mm -hmm. and, like, like there's a whole a lot of different layers to him as the head guy there at the dance studio. Um, I really liked him in the Ocean's Eleven stuff. I thought he was great in Eastern Promises. But then I've had a chance growing back up in Canada. We got a lot of European cinema <laughs> on TV on CBC, and I got to, that's where was my first exposure to Vincent Cassell. Actually, was on those. The dude is a powerful leading man, and as I mentioned in our pre-production meeting, the greatest achievement in his life, though, married for 14 years to. I still contend the most beautiful woman in the world, Monica Bellucci. Well done, sir. Well done. Dennis. <laughs> I, I'm going to buy it as well. He was fantastic in Black Swan. You're right. He played kind of like a charismatic but kind of sleazy at the same time character. And I think if he can bring that over to, to the B Bourne franchise, I think it would work. I just hope they don't make him one-dimensional. Also, we don't know. All the Bourne movies we've seen, like, what type of villain is he going to play? Is he going to play the kind of the assassin guy that's trying to hunt down Jason Bourne? Or is he going to be the guy with the... the the puppet master, like pulling the strings from behind the scenes. I don't know. And I just realized that John Schnepp looks like he broke out of prison and came onto this set. Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> don't, you don't, the authorities know. Yeah. I gotta go. <laughs> All right, I let's, like it. All right, let's move on with this. According to reports, Thor and Cinderella director Kenneth Branagh has signed on to direct the upcoming Disney Weinstein film Artemis Fowl, based on the successful book series. Artemis Fowl is about a 12-year-old Artemis who is a millionaire a genius, and above all, a criminal mastermind. But Artemis doesn't know that he's taken on what he's taken on when he kidnaps a fairy, uh, Captain Holly Short of the Leprechaun Unit, to harness her magic to save his family. Schnepp, buy or sell Kenneth Branagh directing Artemis Fowl. I know nothing about Artemis Fowl. When you said Leprechaun and I read that, I, in my mind, I said, boo. That's what happens when I hear something that bad and corny. Let's force these together. Anyway, I know nothing about it. It's a book, you say? Yes, yeah, a is? series of books. Oh, a series of books. It could be fantastic. Uh, I buy it only on the strength of Kenneth, Kenneth Branagh. Like, we were talking about Shakespeare before. That man knows his Shakespeare. He brought it heavily in Henry V, in, uh, in Hamlet. So, you know, and also he's a great director. He did Thor. So it, it, you bring this guy on to anything, you know, there's a couple of missed fires there, like Frankenstein, you know, but everyone has their stumbling blocks. So this guy, you know, he, he can't really do no wrong as, as far as a director. So I think even with the corniness of Artemis Fowl capturing a leprechaun from the unit of fairy spies or whatever, I don't know. I didn't read it, but he's going to bring something to it filmically. So that's why I'll buy it. I'm going to huge buy this, not only because of all, exclusively because of Kenneth Branagh. The background, all the stuff that you mentioned, but even more modern. I, for a long time, Thor, the first Thor movie, was my favorite of all the Marvel standalone mm -hmm. films. I love that first Thor and what he did with that. And what he did with Cinderella mm -hmm. is nothing short of amazing. Disney's had, up until Cinderella, had a bit of a hard time with their live action adaptations. I didn't think Maleficent was very good at all. Uh, their Alice in Wonderland first one I thought mm -hmm. was terrible. He came along, he breathed such life into Cinderella. I loved that movie and what he did with it. And to see what he can now bring into something like a children's novel series, it makes me excited. I think it's gonna be really good with him at the helm, so, helm, so for me it's a buy. Also by, um, I'm not familiar with the property either, but I do think we need more fantasy in this world um, if done well, and he has that sensibility to him. I mean, he's an amazing actor, producer, director. He can do everything. I also really like Cinderella. When they were making it, I was like, all right, whatever. But it was charming, and because he's such a good thespian, because he really is, he really brings these performances out of his actors. And yeah. I'm really excited to see his uh, Hamlet as well, because um, they're making a film version of him acting as Hamlet and also directing it. Um, not the film, whatever. And <laughs> I'm just, I think that this project sounds really exciting. Thor was also one of my favorite standalones and he's just, he's just got it. So it could be really fun. A little cheese ball, but that's okay with fantasy. <laughs> sure. You kind of give up, you know. Dennis? I, I buy it for the same reasons Kenneth Branagh. I mean, I didn't know what this property at all. When I heard it, I thought it was like an animated duck cartoon series or something <laughs> like that. Uh, but then when I read a little more about it, a young criminal mastermind, I, I haven't really heard that before. So that's an interesting take. Hopefully they don't make it too much like uh, Maleficent where it's like, oh, he's really a good guy. Misunderstood. Yeah, hopefully he <laughs> actually is a bad guy. And I think Kenneth Branagh can do a good job with it. 
You raised an int- a great point about how Kenneth Branagh, because he is also such a world-class thespian himself, Shakespeare backer and all that kind of stuff, you're right, he brings that great stuff. I remember we were talking to Kate Blanchett uh, about Cinderella, and one of the things she said was that she has never in her career, this is Kate Blanchett, been challenged like she was on Cinderella mm. because she's got Kenneth Branagh, another world-class actor who's also a world-class director, and I, just to see what he might be able to do with this, and I didn't even think that Jack Ryan movie he did was all that bad. It wasn't as good as I was hoping it would be either. <laughs> Not nearly as good as I was hoping it would be. But I also didn't think it was all that bad. All right, folks. Well, it's Wednesday, which means it's time to feel a little bit old. It's time for Rewind. When we look at the films that opened 10 years ago and 20 years ago, of course, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. So let's go down the list. Celebrating their 10th anniversary of release this week, the Nick Cannon classic, <laughs> Underclassmen. Oddly enough, to celebrate the opening of uh, Transporter um, Refueled this week is Transporter 2, opened 10 years ago this week, and the Ray Fiennes, Fiennes film The Constant Gardener. Opening 20 years ago this week, uh, the, the film that all of us have seen at least seven times, the Mark Harmon, Joshua Jackson classic, Magic in the Water. I'm kidding, none of you have seen this film. And, of course, the Christopher Walken, Viggo Mortensen, Virginia Madsen film, The Prophecy, which I do remember oh, yeah. opening in theaters. Schnepp, let's start with you. Which of these films stand out to you? <clears throat> well, several of them. I love The Prophecy. Yeah. I absolutely love that film. It was so much fun. The less said about the sequels of The Prophecy, the better. (laughs) But The Prophecy itself is a really fun take on the angels fighting the angels. And, you know, we're not done with heaven yet. You know, this whole, you know, Christopher Walken playing Gabriel. Just incredibly fun cheeseball horror at its best. Um, The other one that sticks out to me is uh, The Constant Gardener. Fantastic film. Mm -hmm. You want to see a depresso film? Check out the concert garden. <laughs> yeah. Get depressed, son. Powerful, though. Yeah, very powerful. Rachel Wise is also in it. It's a great film. It's a probably a underrated film because it should be talked about more now than before. Um, and then I guess the last one for me was uh, Transporter 2. A lot of fun. I had forgotten about the Transporter 2 because, you know, it's 10 years ago. You're like all these action films with Jason Statham. Yeah, he's in a car. He's saying some quippy stuff. And then I watched the trailer and I was like, that's right. It's like him with the kid. You know, he's got to watch the kid, and there's that crazy chick who's like shooting at him. And it's like, it's really well done action scenes. And then it made me think back, oh, yeah. And he's always having like these little tea time talks with that one French detective <laughs> that he becomes friends with from, from the first transporter. So if you haven't checked out the, the transporter two or one, I would highly suggest both of those. They're both directed by Louis uh, Letier. Letier. Yeah. yeah so. Those are really that's what remi- that's what sticks out to me. Yeah, the one of the ones that jumps out to me is is like you transport it too. I am reminded about how much of a guilty pleasure the first couple of Transporters movies are. I really enjoyed them. I had fun with them. Um, where that series has gone now is another issue altogether. <laughs> but I really do enjoy. It. But Magic in the Water is is one. It kind of embodies. It was a 1990s film, granted, but it was like. It felt, followed that formula of a 1980s, you know, the kids got to gather together to try to figure out a way to save the community center kind of thing, right? It's about this family goes to this lake and whatever, and, and they discover there's a mystical creature that lives in the lake. <gasps> but the mystical creature's life is in danger. Why? Because the evil corporations are dropping toxic waste into the lake. <laughs> it's going to kill him. Mark Harmon, a young Joshua Jackson. It's so cornball. But honestly, it's one of those films... That if you're ever in just kind of a nostalgia mood in your home, you and your girlfriend, your boyfriend, whatever, the bowl of popcorn, want something just cheese ball that brings you back, maybe check out Magic in the Water when you get a chance. Not a great film, but it will take you back to the era. Anyway, Dennis, what stands out to you? Uh, the only one I saw on that list was The Content Gardener. And the reason I saw it was because it was the same director and cinematography team as City of God, which is one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies. I like The Constant Gardener. I didn't love it. Uh, one, yeah, It is very, very depressing. Great performances. It's weird because I love the cinematography so much in, in City of God. They kind of brought the same style over to this movie, but I'm not sure if it works. Some of that handheld stuff, and they mm-hmm. also saturated the colors a lot in it, mm-hmm. and it felt more like a dream-like thing when it was much more of a serious movie. So I, that that's what stands out to me. New Rose? Definitely the constant gardener. Um, Walk-ins welcome at all times. <laughs> all times. Favorite man ever. Um, 
And uh, what was the other one? Underclassmen, obviously. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I've Which never launched the career <laughs> of Nick Cannon. <laughs> yeah. It's cinematic. a legacy. Um, yeah, Concert Gardener is definitely, I mean, love is always depressing, so of course they're going to, but Vice and Fines together talk about star power. Oh, the yeah. The chemistry, the intensity. It's, it's definitely a classic. The other ones, I can't say I've seen the Joshua Jackson film, which I feel a little sad admitting. Pacey, I'm sorry I let you down. Um, you and everybody else. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't feel bad about that at all. Yeah. So. I, I was going to say Magic in the Water. I was looking at that poster and I was like, what's he sitting on? A whale? Is that some <laughs> kind of weird uh, rock? Loch Ness, no, Loch Ness Monster. No, I know. And then I, when you mentioned that it was like some kind of Nessie, Bessie, yeah. little baby. And I was like, oh, I know what it looks Nessie, like Bessie from seeing baby. all those special effects books that I would buy 20 years ago. I was like, I know what that creature looks like. <laughs> Never saw the movie. <laughs> Didn't even know with Magic in the Water. What is it about? What a weird 90s title. It's the prequel title. to M. Night Shamhammer's Lady <laughs> in the Water. Yeah. Yeah. Shamhammer. <laughs> all right, folks. We reached out part of the show now for Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime to Collider Movie Talk or Collider Video at gmail.com. Just send on in your emails and maybe you will find your question on our show. So let's hop into it. We got one question today, and that question comes from, okay, hold on tight, Dan Gizwerski, who writes, I've been a faithful follower ever since I discovered the show and never miss an episode. Well, thank you so much, Dan. My question is on the upcoming movie Mastermind, starring Zach Galifianakis. The studio producing the movie filed for bankruptcy. Will this affect the movie? Will it still see the light of day? Rumors suggest it's no longer scheduled for release. The trailers for the movie looked really funny. Can we still hold out hope for this film that it makes it to theaters this year? Thank you for your time and for all the great work you do. Well, thanks so much for the question, Dan. Um, yeah, Masterminds, I thought the, the trailer, at least the first trailer, I thought looked hilarious. Uh, and I believe it's Relativity Media. That was the uh, the company that, that went uh, bankrupt. They still exist, but they have gone bankrupt. Now, the Masterminds was originally supposed to come out in July, so it's supposed to be in theaters already. It got bumped to October 9th, but it is no longer on the October 9th date. As a matter of fact, it's not slated for any release date right now. It is still, the, the last thing I read, it's still scheduled for a October 9th release in the UK, hmm. but as far as I know, that is the only market it's opening. There is no North American release date scheduled as of right now. I hope that they find, it, it'll get into theaters. They'll find a way, they put, somebody put too much money into this movie to not have it come out in theaters. I think it will at some point, but as of right now, we have no answers. Dennis, do you know anything else? I don't know anything else, but I do remember we did review that trailer on Movie Talk. I was yes. on that episode, and I was the only one who didn't care for it. I, didn't like, I think it was you and probably like Mark Ellis that liked it. I, yeah, it just didn't do anything for me, so I don't really care. And they're probably just trying to scrounge up some money to do the marketing, but now they, they're bankrupt, so they don't have that, so you can't get anyone to see it. So I just, I don't know. I think I think it's a losing proposition for them. Hey, Rose? I do think we'll see it. I haven't heard anything either. Um, but when a film, like, look what just happened with The Green Inferno. They also had financial trouble, right. um, but it is releasing. And sometimes it just takes a minute. Um, but Zach Galifianakis is still a star. Is that Kristen, Kristen Wiig, Wiig, too? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, both of them have star power, so someone's going to pick this up, and probably pretty cheaply, since it's having so much trouble. But I do think we'll see it. It's already made. They both are very likable. Um, and I do remember liking the trailer as well. Sorry, Dennis. Um, but I thought, <laughs> it was, I thought it was charming. So I think we'll see it, but this is not uncommon for, unfortunately, Unfortunately, smaller studios to have these kind of issues and then it to resurface and kind of become a, a very uh, minimal bidding war. So I think we'll see it eventually, but maybe not this year in the U.S. Yeah, Jason Sudeik is Noah Wilson also in it. Like, you have a lot of star power. I still remember the part of the trailer that I love the most. It might Maybe it's the only reason I like the trailer, but Jason Sudeik is as a hitman sitting down with Owen Wilson, mm -hmm. his wife and their two kids says, so who is it you want me to kill? And Owen's like, not in front of the kids. And Sudeik says, Oh, is it one of them? <laughs> and I, I just I just thought that was serious. Anyway, Schnepp, your thoughts on this whole situation? Yeah, I also like the trailer. Sorry, Dennis. Um, <laughs> Damn it, Dennis! Yeah. Damn it, Dennis! <laughs> but the, you know the scene where they're like, floor it, and they just smash into that giant gate. I don't know. <laughs> that was funny. I'm juvenile. It made me laugh. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to get released just straight to video. I think they think are going to so? release it October 9th in the UK, and then you'll be able to just get it on uh, Xbox. <laughs> for like tw 19.99 buy it on October 9th and with no marketing budget no, no marketing no, no, like the drop. interview pretty much well yeah. that, but i mean more like a lot of these action films that you mm -hmm. see just popping up like you're like i didn't know Bruce Willis yeah. and Henry Cavill were in a film yeah. that looks like it's a 50 million dollar film it's a tax write off cuz they're like 
they re sometimes films you're like hey it's a crowded summer and then it just gets pushed off mm -hmm. and then it, there is no release date for it so they're how do we get that money yeah. back they're already releasing it all these other places that's my guess is that it's going to just show up on and which is not a bad thing no. i mean that's your second market so look at serena with remember bradley oh, cooper oh yeah oh, yeah. yeah kept getting delayed and delayed yeah. and delayed and then boom it's on netflix i'm like oh <laughs> yeah that was yes. quick <laughs> yeah. did that happen to How'd barely happen? lethal cuz i don't yeah. remember ever being oh, in yeah. theaters yeah. and then it just popped up on my amazon prime well, yeah. Yeah. yeah barely lethal it like played on a couple of screens and then right up z for zachariah same thing that it released is like on like solid film eight, you just eight see it. theaters it yeah. played in and then it's jumped up on my roku so i I guess they didn't have faith that they could market it. I don't know. Wow. So this we we see this happen every once in a while with big name stars, yeah. and it doesn't get much bigger right now than like Margot Robbie, Chiwetel Ejiofor, and it's a Chris, Chris Pine, Pine. Chris Pine. In there yeah. as They're well. They're literally so. the only three actors in the entire film. Yeah. There's no extras. It's like post apocalyptic. It's really interesting. It's slow, but you guys should check it out if you have a chance. It's good. All right, folks, that'll do it for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater showtime and, of course, your movie ticket information. Want to keep up to date on everything going on here at Collider Video? Make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. We got Movie Talk, Heroes, Jedi Council, Mailbag, and we've got our Recap Show Network launching here in the next few weeks. Keep your eyes on open for that. Make sure you follow Collider on Facebook. Make sure you follow us on Instagram as well. You can follow us at Collider Video. We're all over the social media space. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. I'm going to start right here to my left. Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Well, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. It's been fun doing the show with the original OG squad. <laughs> uh, you can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, just by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Get a digital copy or buy the Blu-ray and support an independent film. Of course, sitting over there at the end, Mr. Dennis Zen. Dennis, where can people find you online? Well, snap, the police are going to come here soon and bring you back <laughs> to I'm prison just saying, pretty so, soon. Support an independent film you know, while I'm in prison. the new yes. orange. Yeah, yeah. Me and, uh, you know, the guy from, uh, you know, John the other Schnepp place. John is the new black. Um, John Schnepp is the new black. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And also want to let you guys know that I just uh, posted my latest sketch parody uh this, what is it? The secret behind why Fantastic Four sucked. And you can check it out on my YouTube channel, Think Hero Pro. Nice. And it's, I saw it and it's really funny. You got to make sure you check it out. Awesome. And of course, sitting in this chair right next to me, stranger, <laughs> world traveler, <laughs> writer, soon to be hopefully director, Miss Amy Rose Eisenbach. Amy, I do hope you come back again soon. Absolutely. I Amy Rose, where can everybody find you online? On Twitter at Amy Rosie, Instagram, all that deal. Um, I am about 60 pages into my feature, which I plan on producing, directing, and scoring so yeah long road ahead as schnepp can confirm oh, yeah. <laughs> takes a long time but i'll be doing a couple shorts and stuff in the meantime so stay tuned thanks for having me thanks for being here and uh, of course you can follow me on facebook or on twitter uh, just follow me at john campia that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us for this installment of collider movie talk and until next time bye-bye